Welcome. It's a pleasure having the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm going to discuss a rare disease, Gaucher disease. It's possible that you've never seen a patient with Gaucher disease. And it's even possible you may never ever see a patient with Gaucher disease. But on the other hand, we are very well aware that there are many patients who do have Gaucher disease who come to a primary care physician or to an internist and oftentimes they have certain classical symptoms and manifestations which internists don't necessarily relate to a rare disease. Some of these people can suffer some very significant side effects, disabilities and complications related to that disease which never are treated properly because people just don't think about Gaucher disease as a rare disease. So in this module, which is the first of four modules related to Gaucher disease, we're going to discuss the epidemiology and the basic pathophysiology of Gaucher disease. And I think it's probably a good idea to start off with a patient case, somebody who you might actually be able to see in your office. So consider an individual, a man who is in his 60s, who actually was seen for the first time when he was 37 years old. At that time, he really had no symptoms whatsoever. He seemed to be perfectly healthy. And he was actually diagnosed with Gaucher disease at the time only because he had a family history. He had an uncle who had Gaucher disease which was treated in those dear, in that time there was no real treatment for Gaucher disease, so except for a palliative type of treatment. So the uncle had had a splenectomy after which he seemed to do very well and he lived and actually died in his 90s. The patient also had a sister who was diagnosed with Gaucher disease around the same time that the uncle was uh, turned out to have Gaucher disease. So, this is somebody that you might have actually seen who just came in for a routine physical examination and uh, wanted to know if he was healthy or not. You might not have even thought of asking if he had had a rare disease, but if you take a reasonably good family history, there's a good chance that the patient would have volunteered that uh, particular information. So when he actually did come in for such a type of well person examination when he was 56 years old. He turned out to have a slight decrease in his platelet count uh, and he was actually checked to see if his uh, bone strength and bone mineral density were okay. He had a DEXA study and he turned out to have mild osteopenia. He was started on treatment for um, decreased bone mineral density, one of the bisphosphonates, alendronate, uh, but at the time, uh, nobody thought that his Gaucher disease was significantly severe, that he should require any type of treatment. He then actually, I saw him for the first time when he was 67 years old, and he hadn't really gotten significantly worse at that time. He did have more evidence of osteoporosis, but he wasn't complaining of any bone pain. He had not had any other skeletal systems. Uh, that were involved or any other symptoms of skeletal disease. He had a pretty good blood count. Uh, he did have a platelet count of about 108,000, which is low, but usually not that low that it would cause any bleeding. Uh, the rest of his workup was pretty un unremarkable. He didn't have an enlarged liver or an enlarged spleen. Uh, he had had a problem with his prostate, but otherwise he seemed to look like a pretty healthy 67-year-old patient. The only disturbing feature was that he had a slight tremor and he had some problems with smell. There was some suspicion that he might have some early symptoms of Parkinson's disease and indeed that was actually con confirmed when he was seen by a neurologist. The uh, message from this case is that there are patients with Gaucher disease who don't seem to have any of the classic manifestations. The very low blood counts, the very big liver and spleen that are associated with Gaucher disease, but nevertheless, after a lifelong history of having had this disease, he does have a late complication which is known to be associated with Gaucher disease, namely Parkinson's disease. So this is just an example of a patient who, 
has a rare disease. Many people are not aware that it can eventually lead to a much more common disease called Parkinson's disease. And frankly, we don't even know if he had been treated for his Gaucher disease earlier on, if it would have averted that particular complication. So let's talk a little bit about Gaucher disease and what it is, uh, how you get it, and uh, what you should look for in terms of uh, in terms of uh, diagnosing Gaucher disease itself. So Gaucher disease is one of a group of uh, genetic disorders which are called lysosomal storage disorders. It's an, it is a hereditary disease and it's important to know that its method of transmission is autosomal recessive, meaning that if a person is to have Gaucher disease, he needs to have two abnormal Gaucher genes, one of which he of course gets from his father and one from the mother. If a person just has one abnormal Gaucher disease, they're a carrier and they don't seem to have any effects or any pathology related to Gaucher disease with the exception of the fact that carriers sometimes actually can develop uh, Parkinson's disease as well and that is an issue which is of considerable scientific interest at this time but one which doesn't necessarily have to be discussed immediately with a patient in terms of informing his family. The disease is also called a storage disease because as a result of a biochemical defect in uh, an enzyme called glucocerebrosidase the individual who's affected is not able to actually break down a specific chemical called glucocerebroside which is a component of red cell and white cell membranes and membranes of other cells and which is also a building block for other more complex glycosphingolipids which are important components of receptors on the cell membrane and membranes within the cell because patients are lacking this particular enzyme, this chemical glucocerebroside builds up in the cells, especially in cells called macrophages, part of the reticular endothelial system. And we'll see, I'll tell you in a little bit more why that happens to be the case. Gaucher disease is a rare disease in general populations. It seems to be prevalent in somewhere between one in 40,000 or one in uh, 100,000 patients. That's not the same as incidence, by the, well, by the way. If somebody, if we're looking at incidence, we're looking at how many newborn people will have it. Uh, there it's about one in 40 to 60,000. But because the disease does go undetected in many cases or because it sometimes has very mild presentations, its prevalence, meaning how often it's actually encountered in a real patient population, is oftentimes closer to one in 100,000. So you can guess that you're probably not all that likely to see a patient. The, uh, nevertheless, as I said, there are significant symptoms associated with many patients with Gaucher disease, and that's why it is important that if you are the first person who is likely to encounter somebody, you are really a critical contact point for getting that patient on the right path. Now, there is one group of people in whom the disease is considerably more prevalent, and that are in Ashkenazi Jewish, Jew, uh, Jewish individuals. Uh, these are people who are Jewish, who were born in, from people who could be traced back to Eastern or Central Europe. Uh, so people who know that they have parents uh, or grandparents or great-grandparents who were, come from Poland or from uh, Ukraine or other areas in Eastern and Central Europe are at a much higher risk for having the disease and of course for being carriers of the disease. In that population about 1 in 10 to 12 individuals are actually carriers, which means that about 1 in 800 are going to be affected with the disease with its varying degree of severity. Now an autosomal recessive disease is important in terms of genetic counseling because you have to have two copies of the disease you can only get it if you have a parent who is at least two parents who are carriers of the disease. So if there are two carrier parents, the chances that they will have a child with a Gaucher disease in what is about 1 in 4 or 25 percent. On the other hand, if somebody who actually has Gaucher disease and gets married to a carrier and has a baby, there's about a 1 in 2 chance or 50 percent chance 
that they will have a child with Gaucher disease. Gaucher disease is classified into three main categories. The most common one that we see is called type 1. It's distinguished from the other types because type 1 disease does not have any early onset neurological involvement. Many people think about hereditary diseases as being devastating, particularly in infancy or childhood. Gaucher disease is not one of those diseases except for uh, babies who have this much more rare type, type 2 disease, where it is a very serious disease which causes early uh, death early in childhood. And there is a sort of intermediate category called type 3 Gaucher disease where there is brain involvement, but patients with that can either be severely affected early on or sometimes be much less severely affected and live into uh, adolescence or even into middle-aged uh, uh, adulthood as well. Uh, we don't see that very often, but it's important to recognize that type because they do develop symptoms other than neurological symptoms which can be successfully treated nowadays. I mentioned the biochemical defect, which is a uh, lack or deficiency of an enzyme called glucocerebrosidase, which is necessary to break down the storage compound glucocerebroside. There is a second chemical which can accumulate as a result of glucocerebrosidase deficiency which is called glucosyl sphingosine. That is a much more toxic chemical and we now believe that contributes to the pathology of Gaucher disease. But uh, at this particular point uh, I'd like you to sort of think of ways in which you can build up this chemical, the storage chemical glucocerebroside. In a every cell, uh, there are membranes which have to be break, broken down by the lysosomal enzymes that are found in that cell. At the same time, glucosyl ceramide or glucocerebroside is also manufactured as part of the process of making these more complex glucose, uh, glycosphingolipids. And, uh, we have to think then of the storage process as involving both uh, excess synthesis or manufacture of, glucos of glucocerebroside and the inability to break it down. Now in macrophages, which I mentioned are the cells which are most effective, there's an additional way that you can get glucocerebroside into the cell, and that is by ingesting red blood cells, white blood cells, which are senescent and which need to be processed by macrophages, uh, since that is their primary function. So because the glucocere glucocerebrositis is missing in patients with Gaucher disease, the macrophage is under a particular stress uh, to get rid of it, and therefore, they, it tends to build up and accumulate in the macrophage uh, cells, which are found all over the body, but are predominantly found in organs such as the liver and the spleen and the bone marrow, which is why those particular organs are affected. Uh, in other modules, I'll discuss the signs and symptoms of Gaucher disease more specifically, but be I want you to be aware of uh, two major effects which can uh, be serious for patients with Gaucher disease aside from the classical manifestations. We've learned from studies that Gaucher patients do have a increased risk, particularly as they get over the age of 60, for various types of malignancies, including multiple myeloma uh, or uh, multi uh, <coughs> monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance, as well as lymphomas and certain other hematologic diseases and liver cancer as well. Again, we have no knowledge yet at this point whether intervening with treatment early on affects that, but it is important as you see patients with Gaucher disease who seem to be even mild as they get older to look and to screen uh, for these particular complications. There's a lot of scientific interest now into why patients with Gaucher disease develop these types of malignancies. It seems to be related in a large part to chronic immune stimulation, uh, which takes place as a result of the buildup of the uh, glucose reverside in the cells. Uh, the other disease 
which I mentioned in the case report is Parkinson's disease. And again, right now we don't have any definitive treatment to prevent that, but it is important to be aware that as patients get older, uh, over the age of 70, there's approximately a 5% risk of Gaucher patients getting Gaucher disease, which increases uh, to, at the point of 80 years of old, the risk is about 8 to 10%. And that's important because patients with Gaucher disease can achieve that type of longevity and these problems become significant. So uh, I think that uh, some of the points I'd like you to remember uh, in this module is that Gaucher disease, it, although it is a rare disease, is one of the most common lysosomal storage diseases. It is broken down into two major categories, those without neurological involvement or type one, or those with neurological involvement, type two and type three. It's caused by mutations in the gene that ultimately leads to the manufacture of an enzyme called glucocerebrosidase. And the chemicals, glucocerebroside and lyso, or lyso gl one or glucosyl sphingosine are the pathological chemicals which cause many of the problems. The accumulation of glucocerebroside in the lysosome, as well as these other chemicals, also can lead to diseases such as Parkinson's disease due to interactions with other cellular products such as alpha-synuclein. And despite the fact that we call type 1 Gaucher's disease non-neuronopathic, late com neurological complications can occur. And it's also important to remember that late in patients' lives, malignancies, particularly though multiple myeloma or its predecessor, monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance, as well as liver cancer and lymphomas can occur. So I urge you to try to listen to some of the preceding modules, some of the coming modules, where we'll discuss some of the more classic features of Gaucher disease and what should tip you off as to why a patient might have it.